Hi, I'm Deb Hopper, Paediatric Occupational Therapist from Life Skills for Kids. And I can't wait to see you on the next show where we're going to be talking about uh, sensory processing, the touch system and how that impacts on um, alertness and being able to calm. Hi there, my name is Craig Quinlevin. I'm a myotherapist that's been working within the industry for over 20 years. This year, I'll be presenting with Massage and Myotherapy Australia at the Adelaide Conference. Hey guys, it's Paula Nutting here, and I'm just doing a quick shout out because I'm gonna be down at the Massage and Myotherapy Australia Conference in May in Adelaide or Glenelg, and um, just giving you a couple of ideas about why it's important to go down there. For me, it's about getting together with a whole lot of like-minded people, making all my CP points I need for the year and just actually getting, you know, you might learn one or two or 20 great ideas or technique tips, uh, but it's all about that social gathering and how um, it just gives you that, that excitement and vroom to go through for the next 12 months of planning your, your treatment outcomes or all of that stuff that makes you the therapist that you are. So. I encourage you, if you don't do anything else this year, come and join me and the rest of the crew and all your mates at uh, the Massage and Myotherapy Conference in May. Cheers, everyone. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Sheen from The Connect Show. Uh, this episode, I've got Deb Hopper, uh, who I'll be speaking to during the episode about um, well, firstly, about a webinar that she's just completed with our association titled The Touch System and its importance for self-regulation in people with autism and sensory processing difficulties. So um, Deb is uh, a paediatric OT and uh, I'm just going to introduce you across. Hi, how are you going, Deb? Hi, thanks for having me, Dave. Well, it's it's really lovely. I mean, this show and also through communication through our journal, it's lovely to get out beyond just, I guess, treatment tips, but actually look at the therapist um, and what they're confronted with on a more broader, sort of a broader page, if you like, as far as the other things that they need to be aware of when they're treating and, you know, in clinic with, um, you know, with their patients and clients. So having you along today is a really lovely thing to, to you know, to have you on the show so that you can sort of talk more about um, that other side, rather than just treatment, but actually the other side, that actual relationship between the the, uh, the therapist and the, the patient client, um, and some of the things that uh, we need to be aware of um, when we are treating people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And as an OT, it's it's great to um, be able to refer to. Um, to massage and myotherapy clinicians as well because this um whether it's kids or adults you know we all need to have a good massage and use that for our well-being and i was looking at your bio and it's uh saying that um it's been 20 years plus oh yeah almost almost 25. <laughs> um and so you've been working as a pediatric ot so you're helping parents and also educators i had a look on your website which is like a really lovely website and it's um, broken up into different categories for um, parents, for other OTs, and there was another there was another category on there. And educators. And the educators, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. did you just want to sort of talk, well, firstly, what's the website address so that the folks yeah. at home can have a look at that? So the website's uh, lifeskillsnumber4kids.com.au. Uh, yeah, and so we've got different programs for, yeah, the, the OTs, the, the parents and educators. Okay, and your particular focus is on uh, anxiety, sensory processing um, and learning difficulties, right? So um, did you want to sort of explain how that sort of translates back to the therapist? Uh, and working with people, uh, in, in this case, being paediatric, so with, with children. Yeah, so um, 
I started in um, in mental health, believe it or not, <laughs> and um, have kind of I, th- I then moved to paediatrics and and I feel I've come the full circle with now working with you know kids um, with anxiety with sensory processing difficulties um, and. You know, when I first, when I worked in mental health 20 plus years ago, um, in my first few jobs, you know, there was no sensory um, strategies or acknowledgement in the mental health, adult mental health um, system. Uh, and then it, yeah, it 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 kind of got discovered um, from the peds uh, research, and now it's been, um, yeah, it's it's really a, a, a big thing in adult mental health, which is fantastic. And so with working with both adults to start with and now kids, um, there's been a learning curve for me in the link between sensory processing difficulties and anxiety. And, you know, as as a, a kid and a teen, you know, I, I should have seen, you know, a psychologist, OT, <laughs> massage therapist um, for my own anxiety. And I meet so many adult parents who are bringing their children to me for therapy who are acknowledging for the first time that, oh, I've just realised that I've got anxiety because I've seen it in my child as well. Mm. Now, the article in the journal touches on autism and um, ADHD Mm. as well. And you sort of categorise those, but you you also, um, I think, explain in in the article how there is, in some cases, a relationship between what you're talking about in terms of sensory processing difficulties and Mm. those other conditions. But the other thing that I found really interesting in the article was you're talking in terms of, um, which I I relate to, um, how you feel first thing in the day when you've got a a big cup to fill. You talked about cups and then at the end of the day, that cup seems to get smaller and sometimes you just get overwhelmed with, with what's going on in the day. So did you want to elaborate on that? Absolutely. So that's, um, you know, assuming that we um, are both, you know, typical, you know, we, yeah, we do have, we have a, um, a cup that um, as we go through the day, we, and there's a phrase, um, paying attention. So we do, our nervous system pays with energy for um, being out, you know, for doing what we have to do with, you know, dealing with the noise at the shops or the chatter at work and trying to you know, focus on what you're doing rather than, you know, while you're screening out the other other noise or the bright lights in the office or whatever. Um, so we do, we do pay attention. And that's, it's the concept of thresholds, which I talked about in the webinars. So it's, um, I, I use the, the cup analogy. So you're right, we have like a bigger cup because we are refreshed, we have more energy um, beginning of the day, we have more nervous system capacity. And yes, as we um, pay out that energy in paying attention and concentrating, um, that cup does uh, t- t- tend to get a bit bit smaller. Um, but many kids and adults, um, the way that their nervous system is wired, they have a small cup to start the day in the auditory system or in the touch system, for example. Mm. Mm. Um, so they find life is very hard and and their cups can overflow much quicker than ours can yeah and it's good that you point that out so there are different um senses that you're referring to and i'm assuming you're you're referring to all of them um Mm, because again in the article and i could certainly relate to it that i've had a massage in my life before a few of them where you know i've become overwhelmed with that touch because it's been too strong or yeah and that therapist Mm. hasn't checked in with me and i'm the one on the table who eventually had to say hey can you just sort of uh, tone it back a little bit? So that that was kind of interesting in the article that you talked about and obviously very relatable to, to us as manual therapists. Absolutely. Yes, in the article I talked about how I went away, it was last winter, I went away um, for a work retreat and, yeah, part of my cheat, my, my, one of my hacks is to have a massage because it just fast tracks calm and groundness and relaxation, as you know. Um, but this massage therapist... Um, he like I love massages. I have them, you know, a couple of times a month. Um, but this one, he was just such so light in touch. The touch was unpredictable. I was just like my cup went really tiny, really quickly, and I, I left unfortunately um, feeling really on edge, mm-hmm. really heightened. Yeah. Now, um, as far as uh, other webinars or other resources for. Mm-hmm. Um, therapists from or members from our association 
Uh, mm. I noticed again on the website, you've got a resources section. So do you want to just explain to the folks at home what, what is contained within that? Because I think there's some really helpful resources there for, for therapists. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've got I've got quite a few free tip sheets. I'm, I'm a giving person. <laughs> quite a few um, tip sheets on, you know, basically, you know, fine-tuning the sensory system, you know, helping kids who are fussy eaters. Um, um, there's a couple of different ones on, you know, the lights and the sensory systems, you know, in classrooms and the noise in classrooms and how we can um, we can make that easier. Um, but there's also some low-cost webinars on there about anxiety and sensory processing um, from a parent's and a teacher's perspective as well. So um, one of the resources which we, we're launching um, – in like today, <laughs> in the next week, um, is um, a parent membership for parents who um, may have kids who are struggling or kids who are feeling really overwhelmed. Mm. So, yeah, there's so lots of resources. Out there. Okay, so that, that information will be available via the, the website as well, yes? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yep. fantastic. Uh, and mm -hmm. once again, for those at home, um, Deb did a, a really amazing webinar yesterday and yeah, you had a lot of people along for that, which was um, the touch system and its importance of self-regulation in people with mm. autism and sensory processing difficulties. Now, that webinar, um, if you've missed the live, um, that will be recorded and it will be sitting up there in the Halo um, on our Halo uh, online learning platform. So um, people will be able to access that um, as we speak. So um, if you are interested, you can head to the Halo um, online learning system. Well, Deb, it's been really lovely to talk with you. Uh, what's what's up for the future for you? I mean, we've all been through some kind of weird times over the last couple of years, but uh, mm. what, what's what what are you looking forward to in the future with your work? I am really looking forward to being there and and supporting in this new parent membership. I've got I've got a, a couple of memberships for you know OTs and OTs in business, and um, this parent one has been on my mind for a couple of years and it just it says just seems the right time to get it out there because parents have been struggling a lot um i know that you know even myself and my own family this term it's been um it's been like a bit of a roller coaster with you know getting back to school and you know it's covid normal and it's like covid doesn't exist but you know classes are being merged and you know the school from home this week for um many classes because the teachers are, you know, they just can't cover um, the classes. So, um, yeah, serving in the parent membership and um, there's another book on the back burner <laughs> um, about. No, that's you know, true. Now we haven't we haven't mentioned the fact that you're a published author as well. So, what what yeah. books have you published previously? Yeah, I've got a book for parents called um, uh, Teaching Kids to. Um, Oh, so teaching teaching kids to manage anxiety, superstar practical strategies, um, which is um, my main book, and I've got a couple of books out there on sensory processing for kids, which I wrote with my kids actually. Um, one's called Fireworks Freak Out for kids who find the fireworks hard, um, <laughs> and the other one is that Alex learns that changes are okay, um, which is talking about um, transitioning to the holidays and, and back again because lots of kids, whether they have autism or not. Um, they struggle with those transitions from school to holidays to school again. Sure, sure. Good reading. Yeah. Good reading. So, again, that would be uh, accessible via your website. Yeah, just Google just Google my name um, and they'll come up on Amazon and everywhere else. Yeah, fantastic. Well, once yeah. again, Deb, lovely to have you on board here for our Connect show this, uh, this month. Um, great webinar and great resources. As I said, I had a really good look through your website like it's, it's very, very well um, built, very well set out. Lots of free resources and lots of um, other information there um, that the folks at home can access. So again, yeah. thanks so much. Everyone at home, thanks very much for listening. See you later. Thanks, Dave. Hi, I'm Anne Davies, CEO of Massage and Myotherapy Australia, and I'm here with Professor Sandra Grace. Welcome, Sandra. It's good to chat to you. Now, you're the dep I'm going to read this because it's such a long title. The Deputy Chair of Academic Board Teaching and Learning, Principal Fellow, Higher Education Academy, Faculty of Health, Southern Cross University. <laughs> Sorry, did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Anne.
So, yeah. So I'm here to talk to Sandra about the Workforce Survey, which is the Australian National Natural Therapies Workforce Survey, which Sandra is coordinating. Now, I was invited, this is, um, to take a step back, this is instigated by ATMS, our friends at ATMS who have asked Sandra to coordinate this. And then I was invited onto the steering committee to actually develop the survey. So what, what happens at the steering committee end, Sandra? Um, uh, well, thanks, Anne. Uh, if I could start by just giving a little bit of that background. Mm -hmm. um, this survey was originally developed in the year 2000. It was a result of um, a grant from the government uh, when we were first introducing the GST. And so this survey uh, was designed to get a snapshot of the natural therapies professions, and it was published in about uh, 2002. Then a decade later, um, we decided that it would be really good to see what had happened in the professions over that decade. So we took the uh, original survey, um, checked that the questions were still relevant because different issues, as you can imagine, become more important than others. Um, and we uh, conducted it again in 2012. So it's a decade later. Wow. And we're very keen to have a look at how this uh, the professions have evolved over the now 20 years. Uh, and uh, quite rightly, Anne, you mentioned that ATMS commissioned this research, um, but I guess I want to say fundamentally it's multidisciplinary. Um, ATMS kindly offered to sponsor it, so they are funding the statistician. But apart from that, this is meant to be across professions and hence the, uh, the birth of the steering committee. We've always had a steering committee even in previous iterations of this survey. So we invited um, representatives of as many professional associations that we could find. We're very delighted that your association came on board. Oh, thank you. And that, that's a really important um, thing to say in that it, the steering committee was very well represented from all professions in natural therapy, wasn't it? it was, it's not just about the massage industry. That's right. And we had some lovely robust uh, debates because we're caught between trying to maintain as much of the original uh, survey so we can compare data across time, but also some, you know, the issues have changed. So uh, there are some new issues that we've included in this survey and some things that are no longer relevant. Uh, and I had a bit of a chuckle when we looked at the, the gender question, for example, uh, society's thinking about how we ask those questions has changed dramatically. So that was the sort of thing that was modified to uh, make the survey more appropriate for today's audience. Yeah. And I, the, the survey is classified as research, you know, and a, a lot of people don't understand research. So how can this data be used or useful? What, what's the purpose of it? Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's a great question, Anne. It is research, and that means that um, for a start, we've got to develop a very rigorous methodology. Um, I'm a strong supporter of as much quality research as we can possibly do in natural therapies. Um, I coordinate the Masters by Research uh, projects in the osteopathy program at Southern Cross, and I, you hear me often say, what we don't need is any more low-quality <laughs> studies. So we want to make it rigorous. Um, and so to do that, uh, you know, there's a, a team of myself and a couple of other researchers and the steering committee, and we use that brains trust to develop a quality uh, survey instrument. We then have to go through an ethics committee. So the ethics committee um, have to uh, ensure that uh, we minimise the risk and they maximise, we, max, we maximise the benefit. In fact, that's their job to weigh up if we are going to go ahead with any kind of research, the, the benefit to individuals and the profession and the community at large have to outweigh any potential risks. Right, okay. And so the, the use of the data? Once it's all so what we'll what we'll do with this uh, we're only going to report group data so there's there's no personal information gathered at all um, so we collate all that data and it gives us an accurate snapshot of where the profession's at in Australia at the moment as I mentioned before it lets us compare 
the last two uh, iterations of this survey. So we get to see how the profession has evolved. So, for example, I can remember some years ago, um, we were interested in whether people worked in, in um, solo private practice, or whether they were you know, working more in, in multidisciplinary clinics, integrative medicine clinics and so on. So it gives us a snapshot of, about that. Um, and it also informs our lobbying um, and our policy development uh, to guide the way the profession moves forward. So I'll give an example of that. Uh, you'll notice in the current iteration, there's a couple of questions about the impact that the removal of um, the subsidies for natural therapies rebates from the private health funds might have had on anyone's practice. We've also got a couple of questions on um, our profession's attitude towards the um, vaccine mandates. That information we'll use uh, in our lobbying, particularly with the, the uh, federal election um, on our doorstep. Yes, it is on our doorstep. And you know, massage and my therapists were very fortunate back in, I think it was 2015, wasn't it, during the, the private health insurance? Yes. Review. And it wasn't removed, but a lot of our, those that are included in the survey were removed, like naturopathy was removed from the private health rebate. So it will be really interesting to see the effect it had and the effect on the public as well, you know, not seeking those treatments just because they can't get the that, rebate. That's right, yeah. And, and this sort of data that we have collected from the profession, it helps us lobby to make sure that either we can uh, argue for some of those rebates to be reinstated, but it also protects the current rebates. It does, absolutely. Yeah. Now, by now, everyone who's watching this should have received an email asking them to complete the survey. And I really, really urge everybody, the more data that we get, the better. Um, but we have had a bit of feedback about privacy. Some of our members are a little concerned that if they enter certain data that, you know, they could be recognised. Um, there's no issue whatsoever, is there? No, we wouldn't have been allowed to get through ethics uh, if there'd been any risk of that. So uh, I just want to uh, assure anyone who's about to take this survey that, um, you know, there is some personal information asked in there. Uh, remember, you can always stop the survey. You can skip a question. You're not forced to write anything you don't want to. Um, uh, but if you do want to answer the question, and we, we hope you do, rest assured that there's no way. We don't collect any personal data. There's, it's just um, a number. It comes up as a number to us in the Qualtrics survey platform. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get to the end of the survey, there is an option because some people might want um, their professional associations to know that they've um, completed the survey, and I'll let you talk a bit more about that in a moment, Anne, but also you might want a copy of the results. And so at the, at the end of the survey, if you want to answer yes to that question at the end, it actually takes you to a completely separate survey, which right. says, okay, now give us your professional association and your, your membership number and tick whether you want a copy of the results. And that, that would be fed back to uh, professional associations, but it's completely separate from the Actual survey. So it doesn't get downloaded with the data? Not again. at all. Not, not, not at all. Look, we've got a statistician in the tight budget. That, you know, there's no interest in, in that at all. It's not what we're on about. We're no. interested in trying to find out as much as we can about the profession, which is why we need as many people as possible to respond. Oh, good. And all associations that were part of the steering group all agreed that their members could claim CPE points towards completing the survey, which is the reason for collecting people's names and their member number so that we know that they have actually completed the survey. So again, we urge everybody to do it. I know that you know when I speak to members, we're reminding them, when my team is speaking to members, we're reminding them to complete the survey and it will help every association in their advocacy, their lobbying, their policy making, um, even RTOs, possibly, it will help them, you know, with future students. So, so um, any last words, Sandra, other than... Uh, no, look, thank you very much, Anne. I just want to thank you and the association for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for being part of the steering committee because it's, oh. it's really valuable. There aren't many opportunities when we work together. No. You know, as natural therapies professions as one, and here's a fantastic opportunity, and I really appreciate your uh, coming on board.
You're very welcome. And I am so looking forward to seeing the comparison of 20 years of data. That is just going to be fantastic. So, all right, thanks so much for your time and we look forward to the results. Thank you, Anne. Thanks.